Ryan here with Dark Rangers Inc. And today we're gonna go over one of the two biggest gripes I get when it comes to image processing. The first of which is getting the perfect stretch, typically in GHS. And then the second one is getting amazing colors in your image. And it's really no surprise that those are the two biggest issues most people have, because when it comes to image processing, what we're really dealing with is the interplay between light and color. This topic comes to us after my last video where I showed you guys how to get the best colors using Photoshop and some of the tools that I use. And one of the Patreon Dark Rangers Inc. community members, Greg, asked if we could go over a little bit of color theory. Because as much as we like to say it's artist prerogative, when we all look at an APOD award-winning image, most of us can agree that it at least looks good. Some of us might like it more than others, but we all recognize innately that there's something about it that makes us enjoy looking at it. And to soothe both hemispheres of your brain, I'm gonna not only go over the science, but a little bit of the art involved and make sure that by the end we tie it back into why this matters so much when it comes to your image processing. As somebody who's worked really hard to improve their colors over the last year, culminating in my most recent edit, which is arguably my favorite, especially in terms of color, I wanna make sure that you guys all understand how to manipulate color so that you can get your next best image as well. When it comes to color in our world, we work in the RGB or red, green, and blue color space, but there's also CMY, which is cyan, yellow, and magenta. And you'll notice that where these colors intersect, they actually create the opposing palette. So when you look at certain tools in PixInsight or Photoshop, like Selective Color, you're probably wondering why do they use cyan and not teal or magenta and not pink? And it's essentially because these six colors can create any color on the color spectrum and they work together in a very direct way. When it comes to colors in general, we have primary colors, which are red, blue, and yellow. And we also can mix those to create secondary colors, which are orange, violet, and green. Now, all six of these make up the very familiar color wheel, which probably you guys saw this in grade school. Yeah. And these are actually really nice tools to have, believe it or not. It's double-sided and it really covers a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about today, as it shows us complementary colors, or basically colors that are on the opposing side of the color wheel. And when you mix these together, they usually neutralize each other, but when you keep them separate, they're visually appealing to the eye. When you think about complementary colors, think of sports teams where you have yellow and purple like the Lakers or orange and blue like the Bears. And we also have analogous colors, which are colors that are right next to each other. So violet, blue, violet, and blue would be analogous. You also shows you the triadic, which would be a triangle shape. So you can move this around to create different sets, but in the the current position would be yellow, red, and blue tend to look good together. And then also tetradic, which is a rectangle or a, type, a square type shape, which are also called split complementary colors. We also have achromatic, meaning lacking color, and monochromatic, but not in the way that we use it in astronomy. What we call monochrome would actually be considered grayscale. Monochromatic takes different shades, tints, and tones of the same color and uses it to create a harmony between the prominent hue within the color. If we take uh, red, for example, you can see here that it goes all the way from near white to a dark red by mixing it with white in this situation and that's known as a tint. Any color mixed with gray is a tone. That's what most pastels are. And any color mixed with black is known as a shade. So when folks say they're getting their cars tinted, they're actually getting them shaded. We also think about color in terms of warm and cool. And in astronomy, the contradictory thing there is warm colored stars are actually the coolest in terms of temperature and cool blue colored stars are typically some of the hottest. There's also a Doppler shift when we see things that are red it's typically lengthening the wavelength and things that are traveling further away from us this is how we know the universe is expanding and blue Doppler shift is a shortening of the wavelength and it means something is coming towards us and we're all familiar with wavelengths that make up the color spectrum because of looking at a filter chart. We all know hydrogen alpha and sulfur 2 emit in the upper 600 nanometer range, which is red. 
Oxygen 3 and H beta are somewhere near 500 nanometers in the blue wavelength and so on. And of course, these filters are designed to block out all the colors in the yellow and orange wavelengths, which typically are signs of traditional light pollution like street lamps and things of that nature. We also want to look at the intersection of light and color and what happens. In general, when we add luminance to an image or brighten it, it tends to desaturate an image. In my last Photoshop video before I add some luminance to yellow to brighten it up, you'll see that I stop and add some saturation first because I know it offsets that effect. The more luminance you have, it tends to give the appearance of less color. So when I add luminance, I always bump up the saturation first. As you darken an image on the flip side, it's also going to make it look oversaturated. So this is what happens when you see an overcooked or overprocessed image. As you add more contrast and darken it and clip those blacks, you're not only making it look overly dramatic from a light perspective, but it's also going to look more and more oversaturated. So if you've noticed that as you stretch an image, the colors tend to change, you have to be really cognizant of light's effect on color when doing your image processing. For those of you guys working in LRGB monochrome, you've probably noticed that your RGB images have a lot more color than when you add a luminance layer to it, same effect. I'm sure you've also noticed that as you overstretch an image, it tends to not only look kind of blown out and faded from a light perspective, but the colors also start to get softer as well. Now, once you understand how light and color combine, it's on to probably the most important conversation of this episode, which is how different colors combine. Now, we were looking at uh, color sets where you keep them separate, but what happens when you mix them together? And that's really what you need to understand to get the most out of your processing software and to really be able to take control and be more intentional when it comes to your edits. Because a lot of folks just end up kind of nuking green, and it's not just that you're getting rid of green, you're getting rid of the way that green interacts with all of the surrounding colors. And so what you end up doing is on an SHO Hubble palette image, when you get rid of green, you just kind of turn it into a blue and orange image and you miss out on all the other colors that you get because we know we need to have red, green, and blue to make the whole palette. So if we completely get rid of one, we've drastically reduced the number of total colors that we can potentially have. Conversely, if I want to neutralize an image, it's helpful to know which color is gonna be the best for the task. If I have a little bit of magenta hiding in the background, uh, magenta is pretty close to purple, so I can probably use the curve slider and get rid of some red and some blue, but I could also add Add some green and that would tend to neutralize the magenta a little bit. Same if I had a little bit of blue in the background, I could add a little bit of yellow and it would offset it and get our background back to a neutral black. So when folks send me images, I'm able to quickly diagnose what the issue is because I understand how the color works. And oftentimes it isn't just about adding more saturation to a color, it's about moving one of the other colors out of the way so that that one can shine through. But you never want to completely get rid of it because it's still going to have an action on the other colors and it might be a desired effect in most of the image but where for example red and cyan come together if you get rid of the cyan the red can really shine through now you might be saying well cyan is really more of a green blue so the opposite is really more of an orange red so how do you get it to red well the next slider down on the selective color adjustment is magenta if i add a little bit of magenta to orange red it's gonna put me right back into red. So if you understand that, you can use the tools in both an additive and a subtractive manner to end up getting the overall look that you want. So next time you are processing one of your images, I want you to be more intentional. Before you're going to make a move with either a curves or one of the sliders, I want you to ask yourself and picture what the change is going to be. If you can't predict what it is accurately, then grab one of these or another tool and study the color figure out how they interact with each other. If you do just sit there and you know work the sliders all day, you will figure out uh, what they all do when you add and subtract the color. But a fun game when you're next in Photoshop or PixInsight can be to say, hey, I'm gonna do this tool what is, what is the outcome gonna be? And see if you can guess it. And if you can't, then you're really at the mercy of the tool. The tool's kind of working you, you're not working it. And until you have an understanding of color theory, you're never really gonna be fully in control of your image processing. So guys, I know it's kind of a lot in a totally different type of video, but I think understanding color has allowed me to really advance my astrophotography. It's allowed me to be a better coach when I'm working with folks one-on-one -on -one because understanding 
understanding it can allow me not only to make things better, but it also helps me to make corrections much faster. So I hope that this was helpful, guys. Start to be more intentional and really be a student of color so that your next processing can go not only a lot more in your favor in terms of the end result, but also be a lot faster because you know exactly what to do to get the result you're looking for. So guys, thank you so much for staying in tune. And we have some really big stuff on the way. I have the full Nina conversion. I've got this uh, eagle sitting right here that I'm getting squared away with Nina and a whole bunch of awesome Prima Luce and QHY gear. I do have the NYX 101 coming from Pegasus Astro, and I am still working on the SCA 260 review. The big problem I'm having is a lack of clear skies and the AM5 mount, just having a hard time consistently keeping up with that pixel scale at 41 pounds of capacity that I currently have on there. So stick with me, and until the next one, guys, as always, clear skies.